I just want to do God's will. The kind of revolution that the world needs is a Christian revolution. If you want a miracle, you've got to expect it to happen. You are the recipients of God's grace and God's blessings, and you rejoice in that reality. Welcome to Life Today Live. Randy Robinson here on this Monday morning. Great to have you. And if you're a fan of baseball or God or both, you're going to enjoy today's story because it's a wonderful story of redemption and just what God can do in our lives. My guest is Jason Grimsley. And those of you who follow baseball, you'll recognize that name because he was a long time uh, pitcher in the major leagues, uh, relief pitcher, uh, won a couple of World Series titles in 99, 2000 with the New York Yankees. Uh, and he has a new book out telling his story. It is called Cross Stitched, which when you see that picture of that baseball with that extra stitching on it, you kind of get it. Uh, he's got he's got a tough story, but one that, uh, again, just shows the amazing, amazing grace of God and ability to really turn anything around so excited that you're here judy good to see if you're watching live uh feel free to be a part of the conversation and as always we appreciate your comments uh when you watch it in the replay jason great to have you on life today live Uh, thank you for having me ready so i gave people sort of the baseball bio uh tell us tell us a little bit of the rest of your story yeah well i grew up in a real small area in texas targeting prairie and um didn't really have any aspirations of, of playing professional baseball. You know, if you had told me the day before I went to a trial camp that I was going to be able to play professional baseball, I'd probably laughed at you. <laughs> you know, it's just something, somebody like me from where I grew up, it, it was nobody ever done it. I would never heard of in, in that area. And, um, you know, I grew up uh, in a home. We, we didn't necessarily go to church that often. You know, we went Easter, Christmas, one grandmother was a Methodist, the other was a Mormon. So I was torn between two different ideas about church. And, um, you know, 17 years old, I think I'm going to the military. I'm first generation that's not. And uh, failed the physical. I got a scholarship at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. And um, when I was 12, I lost my big toe and part of my foot in a motorcycle wreck. And um, so they, I was 4F and had about a month of school left and had no idea what I was going to do. But a high school coach of mine, saw, named Rick Lynch, who passed away this last year, saw something and took me to a tryout camp. And I was drafted three and a half years later. I'm in the big leagues. So you know, if I'd have never cut off my toe and part of my foot in a motorcycle wreck, I'd, I'd have never played baseball. <laughs> <laughs> God has a strange way of working some things. So through uh, through through your long career uh in the majors, what what was going on with you personally? Uh personally, um you know, I was I don't I don't know if people know this, but when I got when I got to baseball in the mid eighties, if you were a, a Christian you were considered weak. You weren't a competitor, hmm. you didn't have the fire in you. And me not being a Christian at the time saw no need or didn't, didn't see the benefit or, you know, what that could do for me. You know, I would came from a small area where, you know, we, you fought for everything you, you, you got. And, um, I always knew who Jesus was. I knew that he had died on the cross for my sins. I knew he existed but I didn't want anything to do with him. You know, it didn't, it didn't fit in my life. It didn't fit my lifestyle. Uh, but it, it wasn't, a, in my mind at that time, a benefit because, you know, I didn't want to appear to be weak. I didn't want to appear to not be a competitor. And um, it was just something that I, I, did, I didn't pursue. And um, one of the best days of my life, and not the best day of my life, is the, the day that I met, met my wife strong Christian. And, um, if you'd have told me the day before I met her, I was going to get married. I'd have laughed at you, <laughs> but I met her and asked her to marry me a few months later and married her 11 months later on February 7th. And 
I know without a doubt that if that had not occurred, I wouldn't I wouldn't be here talking to you. I wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't be sitting here at all. And uh, for years, she was on me to go to church, and I'd make every excuse that I could think of. I was playing golf, I was going hunting, and all whatever. But she drugged me anyway, and uh, it never really resonated, you know. And I was living I was living multiple lives at the time. I was a husband one one minute. I was a baseball player the next. And then I was a a hellraiser at other times, you know. And um, you know, I, when I was when I was really young, from age five to seven, somewhere in that neighborhood, I was I was molested by an older boy, and I never told anybody. Mm. And I know there's two ways you can go: you can be the, become an abuser or a protector, and I became a protector. And I ran from that. I didn't want to be associated with that. I didn't want to. Be, I didn't want to be identified as that. Anything remotely sure. close to feeling or appearing weak or vulnerable, or I wouldn't let anybody take advantage of me in any way, shape, or form, or anybody that I loved. Hmm. And uh, got a lot of trouble over that. Um, hurt some people that I probably shouldn't have. And um, all that changed. In uh, 1999, when I went to spring training with the Yankees, a man named uh, George McGovern was a chapel chaplain, and um, <laughs> my wife had taken me to an, an Easter production, and I'd seen it before. You know, I'm just sitting up there watching a play in my mind, and we sat there. And during this particular one, God, when I tell you, he spoke to me. He spoke to me. And I broke down. I started crying. I said, I get it. And I dove in head first. Hmm. And I had Andy Pettit, Scott Brocious, Mariano Rivera, Bernie Williams, Paul O'Neill, just strong, strong Christian, good guys mm -hmm. that, that helped help bring me along. And um I was I was on the path to pleasing God, hmm. if you if you know. And um my wife actually said, um, you're spending too much time with God and not enough time with me. And got, <laughs> got to that point, I thought I thought there was something that I had to do, a curriculum that I had to follow, and um, you know, great things happened in my life. You know, I was seven and two that year professionally, in my professional life. Uh, Pistons game three of the World Series, we ended up winning the World Series, and um, you know, that started the the precipitous fall hmm. of of ego and. And, um, you know, I thought the whole time I had to please God. So what would, how would you kind of characterize your, your life, your thought process, uh, before you became a Christian? I mean, was it just, everything was about baseball, kind of getting married, kind of just the success that we can find in this world that brings a level of, of happiness and contentment, or was there some well, self-destruction already kind of, involved? it was, it was, it was all about baseball. Yeah. You know, it was, that playing professional baseball was probably the most selfish thing I've ever done because nothing came before that, hmm. you know. And then along along with that, feeding that ego, you know, I was selfish in my marriage. I was selfish with my with my kids to an extent, um, friends at home, every, everything. And then you, you throw on top of that notoriety and everything else. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's sure. a very fine line. That, yeah. that you that you that you're walking yeah. like i said i was living i was living a duplicitous life yeah you know at home i was the husband and father and when i wasn't there i wasn't even wasn't anything close to that <laughs> yeah yeah uh, not not uncommon but then when you become a christian um i mean the 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 sort of the idea is that everything you know changes now granted you're you're an infant spiritually. And so there is growth. There's a lifetime of growth. Um, yeah. did, was there a big shift for you at that point? There was, mm -hmm. there was, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, cha I changed, uh, I changed my life. I read the Bible. I did the right things, so to speak. You know, like I said, I was on that path to pleasing God. I wasn't trusting God. Hmm. If I thought there was something I could do 
that I had to do to, to keep earning my salvation, to keep, to keep in God's good graces. So, I mean, and, would it be fair to say that it became more of a behavioral modification r- r- regimen <laughs> rather than a relationship? Is that? There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I, I thought as long as I was good and did what I was supposed to, uh, God was okay with me. So how, what, how and when did that start to fall apart? Oh, from the from the moment I, I was baptized, <laughs> okay. moving forward. Okay. <laughs> you know? And uh, that, you know that was that was that was a great day, April twenty fifth, nineteen ninety nine. I was baptized in Lake Armuk with Bernie Williams, or not Bernie Williams, sorry, Scott Brocious, uh, Andy Pettit, Chad Curtis, my wife, yeah. my two kids. Yeah. I, I think my mother in law was there. And I, George, George baptized me. It's cold in April <laughs> in Lake Armuk. <laughs> And uh, I'm having a, I'm having a great day. Yeah, sure. And, uh, go to the ballpark, and it's Joe DiMaggio Day, so all the old timers are there. So I go in the ballpark, and then I get to go around the clubhouse, seeing all these Yankee heroes: Whitey Ford, Phil Rizzuto, Yogi Berra. You know, just the the names were limitless. And um, go to my locker. So, so I've been baptized, and now it's Joe DiMaggio Day. I've met the old timers. I'm having a great day. And Bernie Williams, incredible guitarist, and I just started play the guitar and he asked me to bring my guitar in. We had a locker between ours and he said, well, I'll show you some things. So I go to my locker and somebody's sitting in my chair playing my guitar. And I thought, all right, who's, who's got, who's got their hands on my guitar. Right. right. So I go up there. It's Paul Simon. No. So I get, to get, I get to sit down and play the guitar with Paul Simon. Wow. You're, <laughs> so you're, been, you're, you're having <laughs> a great day on all sorts of levels. That's crazy. I'm having a good day. So, and so <laughs> Billy Crystal's in there. It gets better. Billy <laughs> Crystal's in there. Nobody will play catch with him, so I go out and play catch with Billy Crystal. <laughs> so it's like a 10-minute comedy show. So I'm thinking, this day can't get better. We're playing the Blue Jays. we got a one-run lead in the ninth, and best closer that's ever existed in baseball comes in, Mariano Rivera. So the game's supposed to be over. Well, Mariano, I think he blew the only save he blew all year. I come in and pitch the 10th and 11th inning and get a win. My first win as a Yankee on April 25th, 1999. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a pretty good day. But uh, that being said, you know, from the day that I was baptized on, I think I was, I thought there was more that I had to do to please God. And I didn't understand what the relationship is about. Mm. And, you know, the, the, the more I tried, the more I failed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I got to a point to where I went, uh, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm good now. I've had some success. I'm, I'm having financially, I'm in a good spot. And, um, you know, win the World Series, it's a big stroke for the ego. You know, you're doing all these. I did David Letterman. We had the parade, the Tater Tate Parade. I'm doing interviews. Um, but Jersey retired at my high school, you know, different things. It all, all became about me again. Hmm. And uh, slowly but surely, I went right back to where I was, if not worse. And, um, you know, then I signed a big contract in Kansas City. And I didn't feel like there was a need anymore. And, you know, the further I got away, the the more of a hypocrite I felt like, the more shame I felt. Hmm. And I just did what I did with everything else. Going back to that five-year-old that was being molested, I just put it in a box and buried it. Hmm. You know, then 2005, my wife's brother, my wife's little brother, is 21 years old at the time, committed suicide. And that, he called me about a half hour before he, he did, and um, I didn't have my phone with me, and I heard it after after the fact. And me being where I was personally, you know, I was a I was a broken spirit. I was a fallen Christian in my eyes, and I knew baseball was at the end, and um, I just wanted to be numb. Hmm. I didn't want to. Didn't want to be around anybody in a room. It felt like a room of people that loved me and cared about me. I felt like I was alone. And then when I wasn't there, I felt like I was really alone. Hmm. And uh, 2006, I got caught up in the, the whole the Mitchell report and the the PED stuff and the FBI raided the house, and I just walked away from baseball. And that's where it really got bad. And I was taking anything and everything I could to numb myself, drinking daily doing cocaine daily and uh, just didn't want to be engaged anywhere. But the thing about this, nobody knew. 
and uh, ended up in three different rehab facilities, two different psych wards, and it all came to a head on August 21st, 2015, where I purposely got in an argument with my wife and went and got about an ounce of cocaine, a bunch of vodka, and was going to snort and drink myself to death. And uh, that didn't work, so I grabbed my gun. Well, first I wrote a letter to everybody that I loved, told them it wasn't their fault, and took my pistol, went out in the woods, turned the gun around, looked at it, pulled the trigger, and the gun didn't go off. Hmm. And um, I was pissed at God. Mm -hmm. He won't let me live. He won't let me die. What do you want? And uh, that started the process of uh, me actually developing a relationship instead of being a monkey on the end of an organ grinder, (laughs) thinking there was something I had to do. Well, I, so you you had it all. I mean, by by the world standards, you you had success, you had notoriety, you had a great gig, you know, and career. Uh, you had a, a you know wife loved you. Um, do, how do how do you what, what, how do you when you look back? I mean, is it just a natural result of? darkness or emptiness and not having a relationship with God or uh, just how, how do you, how do you reflect on your long? Cause that was several, many, many years of just downward spiral. Yeah. I had no idea who I was. Uh-huh. I had no idea. Yeah. I wasn't a baseball player. I wasn't a father. I wasn't a, a husband. I wasn't a friend. I wasn't anybody. I, if anybody wants to know what, hell looks like I can describe it for you. It's, it's a place to where there's nowhere you belong and there's no hope of getting, getting away from it, get, getting out of it. Wow. And, um, I, I, I seriously thought that my family would be better off without me. My parents would be better off without me. I was tired of disappointing them. Mm. I was tired of disappointing myself. You know, I'd look in the mirror. I couldn't even look in the mirror. I absolutely hated myself. Mm. Didn't want to exist. You know, that was, that was a lie that was told to me over and over and over again. You're not worthy. You're not, you're not, you're not worth anything. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're a cheater. You're a bad father. You're a bad friend. You're a low life. You're a degenerate. Mm. And then I believe it. So when you, um, when you tried to take your own life and, and that didn't work and you, you ask God, you know, what do you, what do you want from me now? you know, eight years later or whatever, um, what, what do you think God wanted from you or for you? He wanted, he wanted just the love on me. Hmm. And he, he wanted to know that I, that I, that I had value and it wasn't, it wasn't in a, it wasn't in a, a job. It wasn't in my family. It wasn't in anything here on this earth. It was value that the fact that that he loved me and was willing to give up his life, his son's life, mm-hmm. for mine, and 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 take that burden on, mm-hmm. because he he knows he, he he knew, and I I know without a doubt now that I can't handle it, and with without 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 him, you know life life ha- life doesn't have meaning because you can you can have everything you want. There's always more. Nothing will satisfy that longing, that need that every every one of us have inside us that that God put there. Yeah, yeah. Jason, what you're saying is is so big. Uh, I mean, it's life saving for you uh, and and for everyone. But I mean that is not something you'd even kind of tried it on your own under your own strength to be a Christian or whatever. But what, what you're explaining now in the relationship and in the identity, the value, the worth, uh, and, and what comes out of understanding that, which is a desire not just to survive, but to, to live abundantly spiritually. Right. That's a, that's a big, big, thing um what did coming into that understanding and growing in that look like for you 
Oh, well, the, the, the biggest, the, 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 the real turning point, I had no idea what God's grace was. I didn't know what his love was, but that was showed to me by my wife. Um, after I got out of the last rehab, when I attempted to take my life, I came home and I still believed that they would be better off without me. Mm. I was getting an apartment. I didn't, I didn't want them to be around me. And, um, my wife came to me and she, she told me, she says, she says, Jason, none of this works without you. She says, I love you. I've forgiven you. God loves you. He's forgiven you. Now you need to love yourself and forgive yourself. And let's see what God has in store. Just that, that moment of grace that she showed me opened, it, opened me up to the grace and love that, that, that Jesus has for me. And I had no idea the journey I was getting ready to, to take off on. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's the most excited I've ever been in my life about anything. Mm-hmm. You know, I, my wife was wanting me to write a book pretty quick after everything happened and I was nowhere near to be in, in a good enough space to, to relive it or to, to put it down. You know, I, I just wanted, I, I wanted to do what I always did. I wanted to put everything in a box and bury it. Mm. And God kept hammering on me. He <laughs> said, he put people, men in my life, George McGovern, who, who was always there and, um, things fell into place. I actually had no intention of, of telling my story until I went to an athletes in action outreach thing in Zeno, Ohio, that George McGovern asked me to go to. It was about how to, how to coach young kids and, and use Christ. And, uh, they, there's about 50 people there and they broke us up into groups of, I don't know, eight, 10 people. And first, one of the first things we did, everybody just sort of shared their story. <laughs> well, I shared my story and, Dude, you could have heard a pin drop. Everybody's <laughs> looking at me, go, dude, you got to tell, you got to, you got to tell this, you got to tell this. Yeah. And then I got invited to speak at a church by a gentleman named Q Rem, and uh, went to the church and spoke. And when I got up there, I had no idea what I was going to say when I got up there. Yeah. And I got up there, and words just started spilling out. My story started spilling out, and same thing happened. You could have heard a pin drop, and about two hundred people in attendance and then it was just the, the the applause and the response I got and God showed me said, all right, you're gonna you're gonna be able to help somebody. Mm-hmm. You don't have, you don't have to do anything special. Just just tell your story. Just tell our story. Yeah. Cause it's it's his story. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt. All right. Yeah, that's Go ahead. that was uh, and that and and, and 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 here we are. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I want to show people the book again. This is Cross Stitched uh, by Jason Grimsley. And Lord knows if you've got a young man in your life, especially if he's an athlete or fan of sports, uh, that you want to impact with uh, a, an amazing story of what God can do in our lives, this would be a fabulous one to pick up and put, in, put into someone's hands. Maybe you're interested yourself. You can pick it up wherever you get books. Uh, it's not about the book. It's about what God does in our lives. And uh appreciate Jason taking the time. Books don't write themselves. It takes a lot of work, and, and I'm sure it's a little therapeutic for him to put all this down. But I, I'm, what is what does life look like for you now? I got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, know what is, I know what purpose is now. You know, I'm, I'm getting ready to go to New York and do a few things for the book. Um, get ready to speak a few, a few spoken, speaking right now. And you know, I, I, I love speaking at uh, facilities where, where men are struggling or kids are struggling, you know, they're, they're, they're at the bottom and they don't, they don't, they don't see their worth. And I'm, I'm trying to bring it to them. And I also love speaking in, in forums where you have extremely wealthy men who come in and I get the response from, from both ends and everything in between. Sure. And, you know, I, I I can I can relate to somebody that's eight, or I can relate to somebody that's eighty. Well, yeah, I think people know that you have achieved what a lot of people are pursuing, so it c- commands a little respect. But what about you know when you put your head on the pillow at night? Uh, what just how how do you feel compared to how you used to feel? Comfortable is a be- is a is a best at, at peace. Yeah, 
you know, that's not that's not to say it's all unicorn and rainbows. That's that's not it. Right. But I know without a doubt. Now, I know I I know what my purpose is. And my my purpose is simply to love Jesus and let Him love on me, and we're going to see where this goes. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what's going to be. I don't know what what He has in plan for me down the road. I I don't I don't care. I just know I'm going to get on it. I'm going to go. <laughs> How's your relationship with your wife? She sounds. Does she have wings, or is it she just? Oh she, yeah, well, she's in the, she's in that express lane, so there there ain't gonna be no stopping at the pearly <laughs> gates. She's gonna go right through. Uh, she's she's just an incredible lady. Like like I said, um, the grace and the love that she has for for my for for our kids and for our family and for me is 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 beyond amazing. You know, you know they talk about amazing grace. Well, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm living it. You know, and I'm, I'm, I know without a doubt that our meeting wasn't by chance, that God put her in my life and put me in her life for a specific reason. And, you know, I, th- I think we're living that reason now. And that, that people ask me all the time, would you, would you change anything? And I said, yes, I, I would love to, to change the hurt that I caused the people that I love. Yeah. But the rest of the stuff that happened to me, no. Not one thing. All the all the pain, all the 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 abuse, the the addiction. No, I wouldn't change nothing because I, I wouldn't I would I wouldn't be sitting here talking with you. Yeah. I wouldn't be yeah. I wouldn't be able to tell tell the story of God's redemption in my life. And and all I want to do is give if I can help one person, I have to bring if I can point somebody to Jesus. And have them experience his love and hope. That's that's what I'm going to do. Well, so you you have made a stadium full of rabid baseball fans cheer at the top of their lungs. Yeah. Yes. And yet, Scripture tells us, if we believe what we say, we believe that all of heaven rejoices when one person comes to Christ. You got a even bigger crowd that's rejoicing when you just tell your story and bring someone to Christ. That's uh yeah, there's a, I spoke a, a, a really dear friend of mine, Dwayne Adams, um, who uh, I've been hunting with and I've actually helped guide different hunts in Arizona with, asked me to come speak at his church of San Manuel. And I went and I spoke and um, same thing, get her to pen drop after. And then the pastor there asked me to come down the front and pray with people that were, that were making the call mm-hmm. or come, come for the call. And I said, I'd love to. So I went down the first service and uh, a gentleman came up and he had tears in his eyes. He said, I never, I never understood what my, my son was feeling or, or why he took his life. And I just want to thank you. You gave me a little bit of closure. And I had this, he had made a cross. He is a metal worker. He made a cross and he pulled it out his back pocket and he said, God told me to, to bring this today. And, I know why not. I'm going to give it to you. Amazing, amazing story. And then the second service comes and I, I speak again and same thing. And I go down for the call in the front and we're getting close to the, everybody's come up and there's one lady sitting in the middle of the middle of the church and she's got her head down. And she's probably in her mid thirties and she comes walking up when, when everybody else is gone and she walks straight to me. She doesn't go to the pastor. She goes to anybody else. And she looks at me and she says, I, I want you to know I'm exactly where you were. Mm. She said, I don't know why I stopped in here at church. I don't know why I came, but now I do. And I prayed over her and I, I told her, I said, the gentleman gave me this cross in the first service and he didn't know why. And I looked at her and I said, I know why he gave it to me now. It was for you. Mm. And is just the if nothing else had happened <laughs> with this with this story with this book that just validated everything that God was telling me the about the about our about our journey going forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love it. So you have you have two sons, um, both of them what, in their twenties, I guess by now. Yeah, one's twenty eight. The other's getting ready to be twenty seven, and I have a daughter that's twenty two. So when you look at at them, especially the boys, but all all of your kids, I mean, I think if we're paying attention, we get a little bit of an idea of God's love for us 
we as imperfect parents would do anything for our kids. We want the best for our kids. You know, um, we love them even when they mess up, <laughs> you know, they don't have to perform for us or proud of them when they do well, but we love them through all of it. When you look at, at your boys, uh, you know, at the age where maybe some things started, you had some emptiness, you know, uh, what do you want for them? What do I want them to have, have the same relationship that I have, you know, and, and all of my kids are different. My, my daughter is one of my heroes. She's a strong Christian, great, great girl. And, uh, I couldn't be, couldn't be prouder. And my, my boys as well, you know, my, my, my youngest son struggled a little bit with, with addiction and different things. And he's now, he now has a family and a son and, you know, to, to watch, to watch him grow the way he's grown and the way he's attacking life, you know, ma- makes me proud. And, uh, my oldest boy, the same, same thing. He's just a, call him the golden child. He's just a great kid. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, in the, in the book, uh, Jason Clark, who helped me with it, was just an incredible man. He actually interviewed my wife and my, my three, my three kids. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't there for it. And the first time I read it was when the manuscript came out. And just the, you realize that you weren't as bad as you thought you were. And you understand how, how awesome God is, you know, bring it, bringing them through those times. And, and the, the things they had to say about me, both the good and the bad is, was just, it just touched my heart the way that, they view they they still view me as their hero, mm. you know. And I thought for a long time I was I wasn't deserving to be called father. Mm. And the the thing the things they had to say were just extremely powerful. And you can, you can not the grace that they have in their hearts, and and the love they have you you can you can see that's that's God centered. It's not it's not it's not of them. Yeah. Well, I I love that you're getting to see what God wants for all of us in in your family through you know your obedience and your relationship your surrender to him not not your great works for him so much but your your surrender to him you're getting just, you're getting the reward yeah it's just uh, that there's you know when you become a christian you come to a crossroads where there's there's two paths you can either please god or you can trust god you know and i think and and a lot of us get caught up in the in the pleasing god and and not just trusting him because you go about pleasing God, you still got all the baggage that you have. Yeah. And in your mind, you think, how can I please God with all this baggage? You can't. But if I trust God and I trust his word, that baggage that I have will, will basically cease to exist because I know that he loves me. I know he, he died for my sins previous the ones I'm going to make today and the ones I'm going to make in the future. Yeah. So that, that, that baggage I was carrying doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. Oh, uh, well, yeah. His, his burden is, is easy. It's light because he's, he's shouldering all of it for us. Uh, but man, yeah. Impossible to carry the weight. It, you know, it just, you, you're almost like a parable in a story, you know, the successful worldly successful, guy oh, who's I, got it all I, but is so empty uh, and you flip that around and when god fills it up there's the things money couldn't buy fame couldn't buy uh, well yeah, I've, I've been both the good son and the prodigal son yeah all the same day <laughs> <laughs> well and you know I, I what i love about that parable is yes yes we do see ourselves obviously it's really about the good father and the grace you're talking about yes that's 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 the that's the key to it right there, <laughs> you know. And I, I I feel that all the time. With I, I think Jesus looked around and said, "No, you don't understand. My, my son has come home." Yeah, yeah. You know that gives me that gives me fuel. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love it, man. You got a great story. Please keep sharing it. You're going to reach people that won't listen to people like me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, people in the ministry full time. They're going to be, oh no, I want to listen to this World Series winner, right? No, but seriously, God, God gives us these things and uses these things when we surrender them to him uh and man it's just it's an amazing thing um fulfilling the peace like you mentioned the purpose uh the excitement you know the funny the the funny thing was 
I was, I was never afraid to die. I had no fear of death. And I think that's, that's going to be, you'll be able to see it when you, when you go through the book. I was a daredevil. I, I was a guy that would be in the middle of something going, oh, this is going to hurt. Yeah. You know, yeah. I didn't think about things. I, had, I, I seriously had a fear of living. Yeah. I think that was it. Yeah. Living the way God designed me to live. I was afraid I what I was wasn't capable. I wasn't worthy. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that happens when we live for ourselves, but when we're living for the Lord, it's you're not afraid to die and you're not afraid to live. Because they're all there's peace and purpose and hope and all the good things in both. Uh man Jason, I appreciate you. Is there anything you want to add before I let you go? Anything you want to let people know about? Uh, yeah, the, the the proceeds from the book are all, is going to Emerging Grace Ministries. Uh, we just acquired a home and are building a facility for young girls that have been uh, sex trafficked adolescents. Mm-hmm. And uh, wife's on the board. My my daughter's actually the first our first employee, and uh, it's near and dear to my heart. Love it. You know, it's an absolute horrible disease, affliction, evil that is here that we need to eradicate. But that being said, there, there's there's these young girls and, and the youth that that have been affected by it. They they need a place to heal. Mm-hmm. And, um, we're starting that process right now. I love it, and that that's so great. I mean, just impacting lives over and over. Man, I appreciate your testimony. I appreciate the work you're doing, and I just pray God would just bless you and let you enjoy being son of the most high and living that out thank you sir thank you randy appreciate it god bless you appreciate all you guys watching hit that share button if you haven't liked to follow we invite you to do that what a great testimony i just love it be sure to check out cross stitched available wherever you get books and come back we've got more for you all this week here on life today live